So now I want to get into some more uh, uh, juicy stuff, not just theoretical um, discussion of why tokenization or um, uh, uh, what the institutional demand is like, but what are the actual use cases of tokenizing real assets and, and seeing those use cases actually make a difference for, uh, for investors or the issuers or, or the whole economy. So I want to go down the line, give everybody a, a swing at this pitch. Uh, so Tom, why don't we start with you? What are, what are some of the use cases you're most interested in for tokenizing assets? Sure, so there are two that I you know, highlight. One is you know, the, the native issuance of, of security tokens, right? So we at SockGen are a, a big issuer of structured products and we see an opportunity for the, the types of you know, data that needs to co you know, coexist alongside the structured products to be available through smart contracts and things like that. So in a particular example, uh, last year, about a year ago, uh, SockGen issued a green bond on Ethereum, so it was a, you know, a, a public blockchain, and that green bond was, was tied to some performance measures of, of SockGen's you know, performance with respect to its uh, you know, uh, green targets. When the, the, the bond was issued, it was, there was two components to it. One is that part of it was settled against a native cash token, so SockGen uh, in Europe, such as SockGen Forge in Europe, has a stable coin, it's not available to US persons, so just you know, say that out loud, it's only available uh, you know, to, to non-US persons, because I'm not allowed to market or sell it. Um, but, so that transaction settled in 18 minutes. And you know, so you have the, the, the combination of features, right, to be able to leverage the, the technology and smart contracts to improve the data that's available on the, on the green bond, but also to leverage the on-chain money to be able to settle more quickly. So that's, that's, you know, that's, that's one example. And then the other example is something that we've done closer, you know, closer to here, and that's the tokenization of, of U.S. Treasury. So we have an application that we use um, for internal purposes, that whereby we move collateral around, or you know, move actually settle repo and U.S. Treasury transactions between our entities, and we did that to be able to get the real-time benefits, so rather than waiting for a bank to open at you know, 8 o'clock in the morning and close at, you know, the Fed wire closes at 3.30, we can you know, move assets around you know, at, to our heart's content. But there's a cost component to it. So you know, in using the distributed ledger technology, we're able to save significant dollars um, by internalizing some of those movements and not relying on external bank movements. So, so I think that you know, there's, there's the, the longer-term vision of what we talked about you know, with, the, with the green bond issuance, but the, it's kind of the, the, again, less sexy use case that saves us a million dollars a year. And I, I don't want to derail this panel, but I'm curious are, are, how comfortable are your regulators with, with you guys using internal um, tokenization processes to save money? So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And the, the simple answer is that when you do this work, you need to do your homework. You need to be prepared to anticipate what the regulators expect. Uh, last year, I believe it was, that the, the Fed had issued a... Uh, uh, basically a market guidance that firms that were supervised by the Fed needed to notify their primary regulator, i.e. the Fed, when they were embarking on this type of activity. In the case of the repo transactions or the repo platform that I'm, I was talking about, we did that, that preceded the Fed guidance. Nevertheless, you know, that's, the first thing is to have the open dialogue with them to say, hey, before you do it, here's what we're going to do. Are you okay with it? The second thing is that, and in that case, you know, it's different in Europe, but in that case, we're using a, a private permission blockchain so that it doesn't have access to, you know, so among the concerns you can, you can imagine are things that they've talked about publicly are, you know, data security, access to, you know, bad actors, things like that. So if you're in a, you know, a permissions chain, it, it was a much easier, you know, a much easier conversation. Um, and we hope that will change over time, but that was a much easier conversation. That's great. All right, Dennis, some use cases? Sure. So Thomas definitely stole some of my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All good. We, we have an intraday uh, repo application as well. We do have this open for external clients. We have about a dozen on, on board. The types of use cases are, are basically what, what Thomas described, where somebody needs funds in short order for different reasons. And so those reasons for us primarily fall into three buckets. One is broker-dealers who have different funding cutoffs they need to hit around the US and around the globe. So they're able to quickly access cash uh, by tokenizing treasuries on our platform so that they could have the required amount of capital. 
That's one, that's probably the biggest one. The second is uh, we have onboarded some hedge funds recently where the idea there is they use this and in the instant and precise settlement features of blockchain to be able to get the maximum length of borrow against their treasuries without having the risk that they won't be able to take those treasuries back and pledge them to CME, for example. And then the last one is probably my favorite example, which is uh, we have some loan servicers on platform and what they're doing is they have a unique problem where you know, they know that one day a month or a couple days a month, they're going to receive a large lump sum of cash from people paying their interest and, and principal. They need to turn around and pay out this cash to the owners of these loans, right? And so what they do is to get a jump start on that, they will tap the platform that we've set up for a couple times now. Uh, we've done one hour, $5 billion loans uh, with cash delivered like within a minute. And the power of that is that because this is not overnight capital for the bank, uh, we're able to offer this at a very reasonable rate of, of interest, and they also only pay that interest uh, for the one hour of usage. So it's kind of a unique use case for, for them to be able to quickly, like effectively stream cash as needed. Uh, however, the one use case I spend my mo most of my time on is, is private equity tokenization. And so here, the idea is that, you know, when you think about alts, they don't really have a home. There's no real settlement, there's no real clearing. You have this general setup where you have a, a transfer agent or fund admin, a distributor, and a, and a fund manager. Everyone has different systems, they all speak different languages, the data structured very differently across these firms. And so what we're doing here is building a platform where we can um, consume this information, reconcile it, but importantly also have cash moving through the application so that compared to today you get uh, at the source investor level transparency on high net worth individuals uh, funding capital calls, which is a big pain point today because what happens is the fund admin will say for you know, this RIA, you have 600 investors, they owe $10 million. The RIA will scrounge up the money from their investors. They usually don't end up with the 10 million. Somebody's late, somebody needs more time, and there's a lot of back and forth around who actually funded this thing, and using blockchain tokenization, this instant settlement feature gives you that transparency so that you know exactly the state of who owns this token now, and it's shared with the entire you know, uh, network of participants. So that, that, that's what I spend most of my time on. That's I don't great. think I stole your thunder at all. I think that the, your, your use cases are, are similar, but, but, but uh, super interesting, so. Yeah. All right, Joe? Sure, so you know, just to take a step back on the evolution of tokenization and decentralized finance, part of our thesis at CMT Digital is that we believe um, decentralized finance will be as impactful and transformational towards TradFi as the internet was for information exchange. Now, we've backed over uh, 160 um, early stage companies and projects in the space. If you look at um, kind of the original types of companies that VCs were backing in the space, these tended to be infrastructure plays, uh, ex exchanges, uh, companies delivering payment solutions. Uh, those remain uh, important core themes but if you look at the early days of decentralized finance and the intersection between DeFi uh, and tokens, this really began kind of like a utopia on a, a whiteboard uh, before real use cases got built out. In the early days, you had a few platforms like Uniswap that was offering uh, a decentralized exchange solution, uh, a few uh, decentralized lending platforms um, like Aave and Compound. Fast forward to today, and the diversity of use cases and their underlying fundamental value in terms of their business uh, metrics and the total value being locked uh, has really grown in an exponential way. Uh, I can give a few examples. Uh, there's a platform um, called Centrifuge, which uh, is an on-chain securitization platform. It's basically driven partially by smart contracts, which you can think of as programmable money, and it effectively is a means to reduce costs and inefficiencies of the traditional analog Wall Street uh, securitization process. And um, you know, investors uh, ultimately you know, benefit from that because this is the kind of uh, solution that can reduce uh, latency. So uh, Centrifuge is an interesting example of a uh, live platform and the smart contracts are doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
Um, one theme that we are very constructive on is uh, DPIN, or Decentralized Physical Infra Infrastructure Networks. Um, a standout uh, portfolio company that we've backed is uh, Helium, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, Helium is what you can kind of describe as a uh, decentralized uh, Wi-Fi or telecommunications solution where the community uh, of users is rewarded by a token incentive uh, for providing Wi-Fi connectivity to the public. And you know, it's a project that has really achieved a critical mass, product market fit. Uh, we spotted meaningful founder market fit when we originally invested in this company. And um, you know, the, I, I think it's very much aligned as a company with some of the core tenants of uh, blockchain technology, such as disintermediation and so on. So two examples right there. Great, great examples. Glenn, what do you got for us? Uh, look, I think the panel's uh, hit the nail on the head. And just to summarize, my 